Hi everybody, Devin Olson here <clears throat> uh, for this uh, Umpqua Feather Merchants uh, urine and thing event tonight. Um, not sure what we're gonna get going with first. I think we're gonna watch a couple of videos that we shot this summer. Uh, the first one is about choosing flies when uh, when urine nymphing. So I give a little bit of uh, uh, just some tips and, and what I think about when I go about choosing flies and uh, then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Um, you can put your questions in the chat and then the hosts that are in the background will, will bring them in and let me know what your questions are and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. When it comes to Euro nymphing, uh, one of the things that you're gonna find that's different is that you're not using split shot. So, all the flies that I typically tend to use are tungsten beaded. Those have now become my split shot, and so I switch through different sizes or sizes of beads uh, on my flies so that I have uh, different sink rates. Um, and I've got several patterns with Umpqua Feather Merchants here in my hand that, uh, that are some of my patterns that they have. Uh, the Light Bright Paradigon, the uh, Blowtorch, the Quildagon, and the Straggle Stone. And these are some of my favorites that I switch through a lot just depending upon the conditions that I find. And sometimes, you, just like in any other form of fly fishing, you are going to match the hatch. So I might uh, see a bunch of mayflies around or uh, something like that, and so I'll, I'll go to a paragon that looks like a small mayfly. Or maybe there's not much in the line of bugs around or you have dirtier water or just you're not having a lot of success going the imitative route. Well, that's when I'll pull out something like the blowtorch or a flashier paradigon like my light bright paradigon or in one of the colors that doesn't look at all like something natural, one of the pinks or the blues, something like that. And a lot of times what you'll find is um, that sometimes those are tractor based colors, even though they, they might look the same in sh uh, size and shape as a mayfly, those attractor based colors end up working better. Uh, so for me, I tend to still guess and check a lot. I always get asked, do you have a system? You know, when you arrive to the river, what are you going to put on and why? Well, yeah, there's some things about clarity and flow and things like that that'll make me lean towards one thing or another. But a lot of times I just start with my core patterns that I'm familiar with, that I'm confident in, you know, six, seven, eight of them at the most. And I'm going to rotate through those uh, quickly. And I, my, my first concern is weight. So when I go to pick flies out of this box here, my first concern is I've got, you know, X speed, X depth of water out here that I want to try and fish. I'm going to go to bead sizes that I know that I'm going to need for that. And after I make a couple drifts, if I notice I'm on bottom right away or I'm never ticking or never slowing down in the drift, then I'm going to either lighten up or get heavier as a result to try and get that drift that I want. 
to where I know it's slowed down and it's in the zone and my cider is tracking along exactly how I want. Once I have that weight picked out, then I can go and sort through the, the patterns so that I know I've covered anywhere from attractor to imitative and hopefully along that line I find something that works pretty well. Simply because the method is so effective, I often don't have to, to go very far through very many patterns before I find something that works really well. Uh, because when you're getting good drifts, a lot of flies will work well. So don't get too concerned about worrying about entomology and whatever else while you're out there urine nymphing. Yes, it is wise to, to match that hatch if you have one going on, but even if you don't have a, a strong hatch at the moment, you still have lots of options to sort through, and a guess and check method works just about as well as anything else with me. So have, have at least you know, six to 12 uh, uh, patterns out there, but have them in a, a range of sizes. It's probably more important to have multiple sizes of, of, of fewer patterns rather than a whole bunch of different patterns to try, but only one or two sizes of each of them. Because that weight component is, is really important when you're euro-nymphing and is going to be the biggest difference between you having a, su a successful day and one where you just catch a few fish. So go out there, give it a quick try on the river wire uh, and, and give the Euro nymphing method a, a shot. I know you're going to be successful. Um, pick out a few of your favorite tungsten nymphs from, uh, from Umpqua and uh, while you're at it, maybe grab a few of mine while you're at it because they work. <laughs>
uh, in the videos that, that I've done outside of this, our modern nymphing videos and uh, in a lot of the YouTube videos that I have as well for our, our business at tacticalflyfisher.com. Um, okay, let's go through a couple of others here. Uh, another question is, what are my core patterns? So um, I have, you know, boxes and boxes of flies, like a lot of fly anglers and, and thousands packed into, I think I carry at least six nymph boxes with me on the river, maybe seven. But um, if I had to boil it down to, <clears throat> you know, a few patterns, uh, the light bright paragon, the quildagon. So those are both paragon style patterns that I have with Umqua. The blowtorch, uh, both in the original peacock variation, but also in some other color color variations. I have a purple one with Umqua, and there will be a hair's ear variation coming out this next year. That's a really um, good one. That's kind of part of my core patterns. Uh, another one's just a basic hair's ear, like a waltz worm. Around here, we have a lot of sow bugs in. Uh, some of our local rivers, such as some hairs here on hook, works really well. Really simple. Um, uh, Heron copper would be one that uh, you might have heard of. Uh, it's basically the same pattern. Uh, my straggle stone, if there's stone flies around. And then um, just a, a few other pheasant tail and or hairs ear variations. Uh, some of them with soft tackle and some, some of them not. Um, so those would be kind of my core patterns. They're not really any super different from, you know, most other European nymphers. Um, there might just be some basic color differences, things like that. But, but uh, it's, you know, I have probably eight patterns that I regularly cycle through on in any given day uh, or any given new river. But mainly, I just have a lot of different sizes and or weights of those and maybe color variations. Okay, and another question here. Um, what length and weight of fly rod do you recommend? Uh, well, if you're uh, as sort of like a beginning Euro nymphing rod or your first Euro nymphing rod, you're going to probably want to look for either a 10 or a 10 and a half foot three weight. Um, I, <clears throat> I tend to fish uh, the Thomas and Thomas series of rods a lot. So they're contact too. So sort of my go-to nymph all around nymph rod is a 10 foot nine inch three weight that they have, but also their 10 foot three weight or 10 foot two weights really great. And, and, you know, regardless of the company and the model that you look for, um, somewhere in that 10 to 10 and a half foot three weight is what you're going to want. Uh, it has the benefit of having a lot of the power that you'd find in a typical nine foot five weight that you may be coming from, but it has that softer tip that adds a lot of, of uh, tipper protection um, and uh, gives you extra reach with that longer rod so that you can fish further away from you. And then that soft tip also helps you uh, load with uh, your cast with light flies or even under the mast of the rod itself. You're not casting fly line with you when you're urinimping. Um, you may have a urinimping line, but it's often staying inside the, the guides of the rod. It's not outside the, the rod loading it. So really all that's loading your cast is your leader and your flies. And so you need that softer, you know, lighter weight rod to be able to load those casts. Okay, regarding my current setup, are, am I using actual 3X or so tippet or is a similar... Um, mono or line specific brands. So um, I'm not exactly sure uh, uh, of the what part of the leader he's talking about there, but I'm assuming of the butt section. Um, and really what I'm using there is just cider material. So like the Umqua indicator tippet that uh, will, uh, it'll be talked about in the next video, the, the cider part. So I basically have an entire leader that's full of that. Um, it's about 12 feet of it. And then I just add a whole bunch of tippet from there. And I tend to paint on a wax cider, but um, that's uh, that's probably uh, what he's talking about there. So yeah, it's just cider material for the whole section of the leader. Okay, looks like uh, questions have slowed down for now. So we're going to jump into the next video. And um, this video is on rigging. So it's just a quick, how do you rig for your nymphing video, um, illustrating it using uh, Uncle's new Euro nymphing leader. Hi, my name is Devin Olson. I'm a signature tire for Umpqua Feather Merchants. And today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about rigging for Euro nymphing. So uh, here I have Umpqua's new uh, Euro nymph leader. And it's a 20 foot leader, which is pretty typical for a Euro nymph leader. And a lot of people are gonna think, oh, that's extremely long. How on earth are you gonna cast that? Well, what, uh, if you're not familiar with Euro nymphing, let's talk a little bit about what 
are the components of a Euroleader system, what you're connecting it to, and, and how you're rigging. So first, you're going to start with usually a, a, a Euronymph fly line. So there's dedicated Euronymph lines out there that are just level, and they're very thin, so they have low mass, but they still give you something to hold and strip and, and uh, manage slack with. Then you're going to connect this leader to it. Now, uh, Umqua's leader does come with a tippet or a, a perfection loop here, but as they say, you can cut that off and either directly clinch knot it to your line or uh, just do them, take them both off and do something like a super glue splice to it. And then the, the leader has a much thinner butt section than you'd normally see on a tapered leader that you might be throwing dry flies with. And that's so that as that gets out your rod tip, there's not as much mass and it doesn't sag as much and bring the flies back towards you, but it allows them to stay out in the river where you're trying to drift them and uh, accomplish a, a much better dead drift with lighter weight flies. So there is a tapered section here that's hand tied. And then uh, that's three sections and it's uh, right around a little bit less than nine feet. Then there's 30 inches of cider material here. So Umqua has their own indicator uh, tippet that um, they have pink and then yellow here. And in the middle, you can see I have a blood knot here and there's tags that are left long on that to have provide extra visibility. You can leave them there or you can cut them off as you like. Um, I tend to, if I'm going to fish tags, I'll, I'll normally just leave one because it tends to tangle a little bit less, but you've got the option of having both that way. And then at the end of that cider, you have a tippet ring and you're not going to be able to see that on camera here, but it's just a tiny little micro ring that allows you to connect the, your cider to much finer tippet. So the cider is probably going to end in about 3x diameter uh, from the look of things here, but I've got 6x tippet on this leader all the way down. There's no taper past that tippet ring and that allows you to join those disparate diameters of material with having a better knot strength and it doesn't chew up into your cider every time you try and add more tippet. Then there's a pretty long tippet section here. It's about six and a half feet to the first fly and Umqua's tied it long that way so that you can use it for deep water if you need it, but that's longer than you might need it on a lot of small to medium sized rivers. Here on this river today that we're fishing behind me, the average depth in the deepest part of the run is maybe three feet. So I would probably cut a couple feet off of that and have uh, one and a half to two times the depth of the average water that I'm fishing to my point fly, which is the end. And we're going to get that uh, get there in a second. So straight tip it down to what you'll see on this leader is there's a dropper tag here. So instead of tying your, your uh, flies in by the bend of the hook or eye to eye using the tippet that way, there's a tag that you can put your top fly on here or your dropper fly and that allows that that fly to move around in the current uh, you get a better natural drift that way but it also allows you uh, to avoid foul hooking a lot more because the, the, the fish can get its mouth over the fly and you don't have tippet blocking the bend of the hook as the, the fish is trying to get its mouth on that nymph and then you've got about 24 inches of tippet here um, you could trim off a little bit of this. I normally like my flies hanging about 20 inches in between. So if the top fly is up here on the dropper, if you look at it vertically down, there'd be about 20 inches in between those two. So the point fly is on the end, dropper fly on the tag. Uh, and then having that space not only allows you to spread out your flies in the column a little bit in deeper water, but also you can make several fly changes without them getting too close again. And the dropper tag is about eight inches long for that exact reason as well. You can get several changes out of that before you need to re-rig. And that is the new Umqua Euro Leader. Um, it's uh, simpler than having to tie your own. A lot of Euro Nymphers out there for a lot of years have built all their own leaders, including myself. But if you're looking to have a ready out of the, the package made option to get you going and get you on the river Euro Nymphing, this is a good one to try. And it uses the Phantom X, the new material, uh, the fluorocarbon that Umqua has just released for the tippet section. And that material has a multi-layered construction that makes it uh, have better knot strength, but also has good abrasion resistance and lower visibility than your typical nylon. So I hope you give it a try and that you get out there and have fun Euro nymphing on the river. And if you're new to it, enjoy the, the new method, catch a lot of fish with it. If not, this is still a great way to go if you need to uh, attach a new leader. Have fun out there fishing. Okay.
So um, just a quick reminder here uh, that this will be archived on the Umqua Feather Merchants YouTube channel. So if you do want to come back and watch it later, or if you have friends that couldn't watch this live, uh, they can always come back and watch it uh, on their YouTube channel. Also, um, I run a business called Tactical Fly Fisher, and if you want some more urine and information, um, I have plenty of YouTube videos and blogs and you know, sell lots of urine and stuff there. Um, and we also have uh, three instructional films as well called Modern Nymphing, Modern Nymphing Elevated, and Adaptive Fly Fishing. And I wrote a book that uh, <clears throat> has a lot of your nymphing in it called Tactical Fly Fishing as well. So plenty more here to, to feast on uh, beyond what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, so let's get back into a few questions here. Um, there's a question uh, saying that Euro nymphing seems to remain effective at uh, fly sizes fly uh, sizes that are larger than what a lot of guides fish. Um, can I speak to that, or why? Why do I think that is? Um, well, it's really simple when it comes down to it. Uh, you get better drifts, and if you get better drifts and your flies are at the level of the fish and they don't have to go chasing them, then you're going to catch more fish, even if it's not quote unquote the right fly um, or the right size of fly. Uh, if there's anything that I've learned from this is that much of the river uh, in most circumstances is just being left untouched by a lot of folks that are fishing, you know, smaller flies and indicator rigs, things like that. And if you can put any fly in front of those fish um, at the right level with a good drift, it's more apt to get eaten than if you drift over the same water time after time after time with the best fly. Um, but uh, those fish have already been pounded or or they're um you know they've already been caught or whatever that day so uh really it just comes down to your the best presentation and if you're giving the fish a better drift a better presentation even if it's a larger or uh you know a less correct fly uh, you're still going to get more fish to eat now that being said um if you're a fly tire <clears throat> you don't have to stick to larger flies uh to put you know larger beads on on your hooks and, and i know uncle will have a a tungsten bomb range out this next year that has heavier beads um, or oversized beads for the size of hook. And that's something I do a lot. Uh, when I'm fishing at home right now, um, I'm mainly fishing size 16 to 20 flies and <clears throat> fishing quite a bit larger beads when I need to on them than might be typically slated for them. But I also am fishing a lot of skinny water this time of year where I only need a 2.3 2 to 2.5 millimeter bead in order to get down in it and only a single fly. Um, so uh, that's another common, I think, error that a lot of uh, people new to your own thing make is they just fish too much weight um, with too heavy of flies or too, too large of flies, that is. Um, and they end up, you know, dragging slash bouncing, ticking bottom a lot more than they need to instead of being in the column at the level of the fish. Okay. Um, another question, how do I keep my line from twisting about? I'm assuming that's talking about dropper tag twisting there. Um, well, there's a couple of things there. Uh, number one is, <clears throat> is casting. A lot of the dropper tag issues that I think happen uh, come from just having an improper cast. So uh, most people come from, uh, you know, throwing dry fly casts with tight loops and, <clears throat> um, uh, narrow rod movements. Uh, you want to open that cast up when you're euro nymphing and really make it oval. And I've done lots of videos and other things on this to help you with your nymph casts. But uh, if you have a much wider loop, you're going to get <clears throat> better um, better movement through the air without tangling and or twisting. Um, also, sometimes uh, when you're swinging your your flies at the end of a drift, or, or they're naturally going to swing at the end of your drift before you pick them up, sometimes. If the knots themselves aren't um, directly uh, in line with the end of the eye of the fly, if it's off to the side a little bit, then the fly can get off kilter. And when you have that in current, it can lead to spinning of the fly. Uh, sometimes if you have a fly that uh, also has a lot of soft tackle, um, but it's not um, symmetrical around the fly. So if it has too much fiber on one side of the fly compared to the other or some rubber legs, something like that, it can lead to more twisting of the flies. And if you have twisting going on in the leader, then you're probably gonna get twisting in your dropper tags as well. So you can check out your flies, make sure that your knot is in line with the eye of your fly. And then also just look at your fly and make sure it's not too bushy with 
uh, non-symmetrical materials that might make it spin. Um, <clears throat> and then if it does spin, hurry and just unravel it quickly right away. And then um, you can occasionally throw your flies and your, your rig down river and let them stay tight. And then you can basically strip your line back through your rod held tight in your finger um, while your rod tip is still facing directly downstream and that'll unspin that leader and those flies and get some of those twists out. Um, do that two or three times and then you'll notice that not only is your line and your leader not twisting as much, but then hopefully the dropper twist is gone. And you might have to do that every once in a while if it's a problem you're having a lot at that moment. But, um, you know, if you do it semi-regularly, then that should take care of some of the dropper tag twisting issues. But also, I think people worry a lot more about dropper tag twisting than they should. Um, a lot of people think that if they have a couple of twists in their dropper tag, that all of a sudden it's it's you know the end of the world. Uh, I'll let my dropper tag stay twisted, you know, halfway down the dropper tag all the time without really any uh, hindrance to to the fish catching. Um, I don't really pay attention to it unless it's twisted all the way down to the fly, and the fly just can't move anymore. Uh, one other way that I forgot to, to add to that um, is just to make sure your dropper tags aren't too long. So I start with like a six to eight inch dropper tag, you know, normally more towards six or seven. Um, if you get more, much more than that six or seven inches, then the longer it is, the more likely it is to twist. The shorter you can get, the less, the less likely it'll twist as well. Okay. Um, any Euro fly fishers that you've learned a lot from? Well, <clears throat> that goes back a long, um, a long way. <clears throat> Let's see. I mean, back in the early days, uh, when I first was uh, learning to try and make fly fishing Team USA, I did a lot of my early training with Ryan Barnes and Lance Egan. Um, back then, we were learning more of what would be considered a Polish or a Czech style. Um, and uh, then we kind of just you know, learned more from there into what was really going on at that point, which was moving to French leaders, which is much longer and lighter. And uh, I would say Lance and I, <clears throat> and, uh, I learned probably the most from Lance after that, uh, when he started getting into French and thing. Um, and uh, then, you know, from there, uh, just bouncing back and forth between my teammates and I. So I've learned a ton from Pat Weiss. Um, lots from Josh Grafham, Norm Mactima, um, a lot of the, the anglers that, that I fished with at the World Championships over the last, I don't know, 10 years, uh, Russ Miller, George Daniel. Um, uh, so, you know, I've probably learned more from those guys than anything, uh, Michael Bradley as well. But then uh, also the last few years, I've had the chance to fish with, the, you know, quite a few of the, the guys from Europe as well. So Julian uh, Dagoyans, who's a former world champ uh, from 2016, I think is when he won it. And then Pablo uh, from the Spanish team. Um, both of those guys, uh, I've, I've learned, you know, some really highly technical things from them <clears throat> in how they approach the water um, and rigging and things like that. So uh, there's lots of people out there who've been really instrumental in, in my learning in this and in, in other people's uh, but really, it's been surrounding myself with uh, guys from Fly Fishing Team USA. Uh, those are the those who I've probably learned the most from. Okay, um, another question here. I typically Euro nymph, but find that the slower water isn't conducive to this style. Don't want to change rigs, so any uh, suggestions to fish? Um, that type of water, I'm assuming the question got cut off. Um, well, um, sometimes you're going to either have to switch or um, just choose some different flies. So a lot of times what I'll do is I, I pack two rods with me and I'll have one that's rigged up with a single nymph and then one that's um, rigged up to either fish with uh, two, two nymphs or I can switch it to a dry dropper real quick and fish through slower water that way. Basically turn it into an indicator rig. So that's one way you could do it without having to fully change your rig, you could just make that, that Euro nymph rig that you're fishing into a dry dropper rig. And then suddenly it's like an indicator style nymphing rig uh, that you can fish in that flat water. And that tends to uh, fish better in that sort of situation. Um, and then all you have to do is switch a fly and it goes back to being a two nymph rig. You might have to add some tippet or something to uh, 
uh, below that that dry fly if you have a deeper you know, pool or something. So that'd be one way to do it. Another thing you can do is <clears throat> um, I have a like a rigging foam that you can chop that tippet off. And in that slow water, you could add some other heavier tippet and turn it into a streamer rig. And streamers work really well on urine nymph leaders, um, jigging them through pools. Um, so lots of things you can still do with that base Euronymph leader without having to fully re-rig. But you know, other than that, you can always just move on to some slightly faster water again if uh, you don't want to go through the, the rig changing. And there will there'll certainly be other fish and other water that uh, will be better designed for what you're doing. OK, um, looks like we're going to cut the questions off there for now and go to the next video. So this next video is a little bit longer. It's 13 minutes. Um, <clears throat> this video is all about just all, all we did is I, I took a section of water and uh, Jacob from Umpqua filmed me fishing it and I just kind of talked through how I'm approaching it, um, both in just my positioning and my fly changes, rig changes, things like that to cover all the different types of water that were in front of me. So uh, we'll watch that video and then there'll be, you can put up some more questions and I'll, I'll answer the rest of them for the remaining time that we have afterward. All right, I have a little section of uh, a run kind of sque uh, squeezed between two uh, big boulders here. Um, so there's a little bit of pocket water, a little bit of run type water, and I'm just going to work my way through it. I'm going to start below this boulder that I have here, and that's quite a bit shallower and slower water. And then there's a chute right down the center that's a lot faster and deeper. So I'm going to start with uh, a single nymph that has a two point three mil bead on it and then uh, fish through that that shallower pocket water and when, when I get to the chute in the center I'll probably go up a bead size and then there's a nice eddy on the far bank um, and I'll reassess when I get closer based on what I can see as far as depth whether I need to change back to that smaller fly so let's go ahead and get going I'm just gonna make some quartering upstream fairly short casts here I may be 15 feet beyond my rod tip. And I'm just following the path of that cider. I've got a little bit of a, a downstream to upstream wind, so I can't let this, the leader get super vertical or else it's going to get blown by that wind and take off. So I am lowering the rod angle and just moving it downstream a little faster than I might normally to keep a more horizontal angle with that rig. So let's move out here to this run. That looks a little bit better. And I do think I'm going to need to change this. So I'm going to go ahead and swap out bead sizes here. All right. So I swapped from a two and a half mil bead out to a three. And I'm just following that cider. making sure that I set the hook on any hesitation, any weird twitch like that. And that was just bottom. So I'm going to give it the old San Juan slap, get that crud off. And you can see that I'm, I'm retrieving slack as I make my drifts. So I have uh, my line in my left hand that I'm controlling at all times with it. I hurry and swap that left hand and my right hand when I make the cast, and then I'm just hand twisting line in to manage my slack. It looks like I'm maybe not quite deep enough actually for that center, so I'm gonna cast a little bit further, give it a little more sink time. And that's one way you can adjust your depth without making that full fly switch. And if I'm still not deep enough at that point, that's when I would switch and either add some tippet or change my bead size. But let's come on over here and I'm going to check this pocket below this rock. Because that's sort of the best spot in this little area. There we go. So I worked through the little bit of uh, water in between here. That was the best looking spot in this area. So I wanted to get there, but I always want to fish my way to a spot. 
I got a little brown trout here. Eight, a quildagon with a three millimeter bead on it. See you later, brown trout. I covered this pocket first, then the chute that was in between, but that far side pocket was the best spot, and I thought it would be from just looking at the water, but I wanted to make sure I didn't waste any water in between. That's always an important part when you're out euro nymphing. Don't just go straight to the honey water. You're gonna find there's a lot of fish spread throughout other water types too, and if you are willing to, to fish all of it and work your way through it, you're gonna find a lot more fish that you would have spooked otherwise if you just went straight for your honey spot. I got a nice run in, in front of me here, and right up at the top, there's a set of rocks creating a little bit of white water. Um, it's a warm July day. The temperatures are in the low 60s for the water, and so this type of water is a really good spot to hit. Um, anything that's broken and faster. So um, we're gonna go ahead and work through it. I've got the, the water that's on this side that's closer to me. It's shallower, and then it gets deeper in the center, but it's uh, not, it actually slows down because of the seam from this boulder. So I'm gonna start with a lighter fly so that I can work the shallow uh, water first, and then I'll go ahead and switch to a bead size heavier when I get to the, the fast water on the far side so that I can get down a little bit deeper. So right now I just have a single quill to gone on that's got a 2.3 millimeter bead, or 2.5. And I'm gonna work through some of the shallow riffly, uh, riffly water in between. And I'm just making fairly short casts, maybe 15 feet of line or, and, or leader in this case, outside my rod tip at the furthest extent. And we'll try that first. And then if I need to cast further, I can get more sink or, uh, time so that my fly gets a little bit deeper. But I'll short, uh, start short first so that I can work shallow. There's a fish. Nice rainbow, and I'm not even to any of the better looking water yet. So it just kind of illustrates the point that when you get out on the river, don't go shooting straight for the honey hole. The good thing about Euro Nymphing is that it allows you to cover a variety of depths and speeds of water, and it's really versatile in that regard. So you can fish a lot of that water that maybe in other times you would have left without fishing, and there's often a lot of, a lot of fish in it that you pass up. There we go. Nice rainbow. Paradigon, that quildagon is right in the tip of its snout or its premaxillary. And we'll work a little bit into the deeper water now. So a lot of times when I'm moving around, I just take one step at a time or even a half step. And what that does is it changes my angle to wherever I'm fishing, uh, changes the, the drift profile and just a foot difference in side to side or back to front will change where your fly is at the best part of its drift as well. So I move in small steps and I cover things really methodically. I'm not taking off big chunks. Euronymphing is not a great method for covering vast swaths of water all at once, not something like swinging a fly. You're drilling down holes into every little seam and pocket that you can find. So that's what I'm doing here. If I make a bunch of drifts where either the rig never slows down or I don't catch fish, and there's not tension in my rig, then I know I probably need to go to a little bit heavier size bead, or if the wind picks up, it's kind of gusting on and off here, but I'll make several drifts. If I'm happy with those drifts, I'll take another step and keep covering. And you'll notice I'm taking up slack with my left hand here. I want to keep my cider out of the water as I'm drifting. That cider is thicker than your tippet, and it speeds up your drift or drags basically downstream if it's underwater. So unless the wind is really gone, which sometimes I'll use the cider in that regard to, to anchor my rig, but uh, normally I wanna keep that cider out of the water so that I don't have it dragging. Okay, so the far side is where it's faster and deeper. So I'm gonna work up the near side first with this same rig. Then I'm gonna drop back, switch to a heavier fly and cover that far side. But to minimize the number of rig changes that I have to make, I'll stick to this shallow side first and just kind of work my way upstream before I go switching. So I, I worked up the, the shallower side where I caught that first fish, missed one more unfortunately, but I've now dropped back down and taken a couple steps out. 
and that puts me within range of this faster, deeper water on the far side. And in the temperatures that we have right now, that's actually probably the better water that fish are going to be holding in. Uh, so I've gone and I've switched bead sizes. I had that single two and a half mil bead. I've now gone to a three millimeter bead and we'll repeat the same process. So I'll start low and just work my way upstream. I always try and work back to front, near to far and shallow to deep. So I start at the back first, start close to me before I go far. I start shallow, whether that's in the column or just in the, the area of the river before I work deep. And I'm trying to cover a little bit different spot with each cast, just a, a few inches different than I did the last one, unless I felt like my last one was in a good spot, but I just didn't get a good drift. Then I might redo that drift a few times until I feel like it's perfect. Especially with the gusty wind that I've got today, there have been some drifts that I just know didn't go right. So I, I, I try and repeat them. Okay, it looks like I'm still not quite deep enough in that area. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a switch. All right, so on that last rig, I wasn't quite deep enough. Uh, I only had a single three millimeter bee fly on for this heavier water. So I've gone and I've switched to two flies now. And I have one of my straggle stones on with a three and a half millimeter bead and then a two and a half millimeter quildagon up above it. And guess what? I have enough weight. <laughs> And I have one less fly. <laughs> so I've switched from a single three millimeter bead fly to uh, a two fly rig. I've got one of my straggle stones with a three millimeter bead and then a quilvagon with a two and a half millimeter bead because this water that's in front of me here, I wasn't quite getting down in it with the single fly. It's a little bit faster and quite a bit deeper than what I had been fishing in where I caught that first fish. I'm just going to work through this faster water here and hopefully one of those two flies will do the trick. And I'm just looking for any slots I can find in between rocks where I won't hook them but it might find some fish. And there's a little bit of a boulder field I got to sort through there. All right, nothing in those few casts. So I'm going to move up to this upper part of the run here. And I'll go through the same process of evaluating my drift again. Is it getting down? Is it getting tension? Uh, what's the speed like? Is it slowing down from when it first enters the water? There's something I call the downshift where it's going fast to begin with and then as your bugs reach that lower part of the river, kind of right there, just happened to me, then they slow down and tighten up. It happened towards the end of the drift though, so I might not be quite deep enough, but I did hook bottom on that drift. So we'll stick with it for a second. Hard part about this water is there's a lot of uh, depth differences from, there we go, there's a whitey. There's a lot of depth differences. I've got uh, rocks that are poking up that'll grab your flies that are a lot shallower than the rest of the water around it. So you have to recognize when your rig is actually at depth or if it's just hitting some of those rocks that are higher in the column. All right, so I just caught that white fish out in this heavy water. I'm going to give it a few more casts out here, see if I can get any, anybody else. Um, everything so far has still been on the Paradigon, not on the stone I put on, so I switched now to two Quildagons. And we'll see how it works. And with that wind, I'm having to keep that lower rod angle. And my side are a little bit more horizontal than I might normally. A lot of times I try and have a fairly vertical angle with my cider. But right now the wind is blowing from downstream to upstream enough that wants to take off like a kite if I try that. There we go. So this fish was on the far bank in among the boulders. Looks like another white fish. I've now caught browns, rainbows, and whiteys on this one run. Oh, and it's off, so that's all right. So I hope working through this little bit of water has been instructive for you. Uh, urine nymphing is just a really great way to catch fish. And like I said before, it's not a way that you're going to cover vast swaths of water um, all at once. It's not going to be like swinging flies or, or even making really long indicator nymph casts. What I'm doing is I'm drilling down into specific spots, making lots of drifts in them and extracting lots of fish. Um, and if you go out and you follow the same sort of pattern, work back to front, near to far, and then shallow over to deep, 
you're going to catch a lot of fish along the way. Have fun on the water. All right. <clears throat> so hopefully that was uh, a little bit helpful for you in just thinking about how to cover uh, a piece of water in front of you and how to methodically go about it, not just go straight to where you think the fish are, but work your way into it and hopefully pick off some fish along the way. I know that's been really important for me lately as I've been fishing around <clears throat> my local water because there's a lot of fish spread into really shallow water types that oftentimes um, you might even step on if you weren't looking carefully. Okay, a couple more questions here. Um, this one, it says, you catch uh, a lot of fish in your videos. How much of this is selecting great rivers versus technique? So, um, you know, I am, I am blessed in that I live uh, here in the Rockies and in Utah, but um, we've shot, you know, videos kind of all around the West. Um, we have a lot of good water around here, but everything that we've ever shot on for all of our videos has been sort of hard fished public water. Um, we don't go to, you know, private rivers and some pay to play ranch and, and try to film in there. It's all pretty hard fished public water um that you know has good numbers of fish but a lot of times they're really hard to catch uh one of the rivers just my home water here uh, in utah that that we film a lot on or do most of our filming on frankly has a good density of fish but it's it's kind of has a reputation for beer being really hard and not giving up very many fish um but frankly i think it's just because it's not fished very well by most people and with the right technique and the right approach the right coverage of water there's lots and lots of fish there to catch and so um, I think a lot of it just does boil down to technique and just proper coverage of water um, so you know that's probably how I'd answer that question uh, I, you know I don't want to sound arrogant or um, you know, like I'm bragging about it but in the end uh, you know, I have been doing this for, for a long time um, I've been at the Euro Nymphian game since about 2000 and five, um, really the, the French sort of longer leader and uh, thinner leader thing since about 2007. So I have a lot of background in it and a lot of practice as well, but it's something that anybody that uh, could come fish the same rivers and, and catch a lot of fish as well, just playing correct technique. Okay, uh, keeping contact with your fly, can you explain how that is done with light flies? Um, well, the easiest way to go about doing that with light flies uh, is to fish a much lighter leader. So one of the re main reasons why I've gone to, to micro leaders so that I can fish a lot less weight to fish the same amount of water or the same depth and speed of water. Um, so it is true that if you have a, a thicker leader, uh, you're going to get sort of a belly or an arc or some sag in that leader when fishing light flies, especially. And so you end up having to fish heavier flies to compensate for that sag in order to keep that contact or, or you know, I also, um, I don't really like uh, always thinking about keeping contact with my fly. I'm more watching the speed of the drift and just the pattern of tension in my, my leader. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people think about leading their flies through drift or something to keep contact. There's lots of different angles you can use during a drift. I'm not always using a downstream angle on my leader to keep contact or, or to lead them. A lot of times I'm letting it get totally vertical and letting the weight of the fly uh, make that contact, but as the question <clears throat> gets to, that's harder with the light fly because there's not enough weight there to, to really overcome that gravity. So, um, fish a lighter leader. I think that's probably the best way to do that with light flies. Uh, if you're having a hard time casting, you know, anything thinner than what you, you're already fishing, then work on it. Spend a lot of time in your backyard, not just on the river, but a lot of time in your backyard. Set up a target and put, you know, start building and fishing thinner leaders and put a, an, un, like a thing, a split shot on the end of your, your leader where your fly would go, or just take one of your flies that you normally fish and cut the hook off of and uh, start casting it at a target in your backyard. And if you can start hitting, hitting that target with a certain diameter or leader, then step it down one more diameter. Um, go to, maybe just go to an all cider leader that's thinner um, and play with that for a bit. Once you're used to casting that again, keep going until, you know, as thin as you can get. Um, like I said earlier, the micro leader that I'm fishing right now, the butt section of the leader from my fly line to my tippet ring, it's all 4X tippet. So it's all really thin. And then from after that, I've got 6 or 7X tippet most of the time. 
but that really thin leader helps me keep um, really good contact or the, the sensitivity of my rig is a lot better because there's just no sag in between compared to having a thicker leader. So um, that's one way to do it. Okay, what's my go-to sow bug pattern? Um, well, I have an old sow bug pattern that I used to fish a lot around here. It's just real simple. Um, and it's kind of like uh, hair's ear dubbing on a hook or some actual sow scud dubbing on a hook um, with uh, D-rib or V-rib pulled over the back and then just ribbed with um, mono, like 5X tippet, something like that. Um, and that works really fine. Uh, it works great. You can brush it out, make it kind of leggy and flat. But honestly, these days, my go-to sow bug pattern is just a real simple waltz worm. Just hairs you on a hook. Uh, I might brush it out a little bit and then trim it. But uh, that, you know, I, I, I live in a, an area that has a lot of sow bugs where the fish get pretty focused on them at times. And that waltz worm works just as well as any dedicated sow bug pattern that I fish. Um, sometimes I might mix in a little kind of hot spot or some flash or something into the dubbing to uh, make it set apart in the drift, but but that's you know, that's pretty much it. Um, another question, when the fish are rising, can you use a dry fly on a Euro rig? And really my answer to that would be no. Um, I don't I don't try and fish dries on my Euro rig. I do fish dry dropper a lot. You know, the issue is just, you have to have weight on your leader in order to be able to cast it. Um, because we're not loading the rod with a fly line. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we, we just have a really long leader uh, that we're dealing with here and we're not, we don't really have fly line coming out the rod. Then fishing a dry fly on that leader is very difficult. Can it be done at times? Yes. Um, you can do it by building specific leaders that are sort of hybrid leaders that um, have some taper built in that help turn things over. Um, me, I'm kind of a splitter rather than a lumper. I, I don't really like trying to have one rig to do it all. I'm the kind of person that's going to either bring multiple rods or just multiple uh, reels or something um, to do the, to specifically match the technique that I want to fish. So I'll often bring a separate dry fly rod with a, a ready to go, you know, te a very technical dry fly, like a long dry fly leader, but still a dry fly approach with a shorter uh, rod as well, like a nine foot four weight and you know, typical weight forward fly line. Um, so I, I often have that ready to go if I think I'm going to have uh, very much dry fly fishing uh, around. Um, if it's dry fly fishing where it's just the occasional rise and you think you can dry dropper of those fish, then you can do it on your Euro rig. But I probably wouldn't try to just single dry fly uh, with the Euro leader. Okay. Uh, one last question here, since we don't have much time left. Difference between the micro leader and a euro leader. All my micro leader is is just a really thin version of a euro leader. So, uh, if you notice in the second video that um, we watched tonight, I, I talked about using Umpqua's euro nymphing leader um, as a way to rig up with that, and that leader still has a taper built into it. So it starts with a little bit thicker material gradually tapers down to a thinner and thinner material, kind of like a regular fly fishing leader, until you hit that cider material that's that fluorescent uh, or you know, very visible nylon that's built into the leader that helps you, um, helps, you know, you see your takes. Um, and that taper to the leader gives energy transfer so that it makes it easier to cast. And so that's why a lot of people want to start with that. But that thicker part of the leader does have more mass and with more mass you succumb to gravity and more sag and so your leader ends up you know, having some droop in the, while you're making your um, your drifts. So by what I mean when, when I'm talking about micro leader you probably have the same length of leader it's still around 20 feet long but that butt section is all one diameter and it's all very thin. So that butt section might be 3x or 4x tippet just so that it's a size or two bigger than in uh, actual terminal tip it is so that you know, it's not breaking all the time and that really really thin material for your butt section uh, makes it so that you don't have um, much sag and you can get really good sensitivity uh, for, for strike detection and or just knowing what's going on in your rig you can actually start to delineate between um, when your leader and your cider stops you can 
tell pretty easily when it's a fish that has taken it and when it's bottom, um, things like that. And then also you can fish further away from you and just fish less weight. So the, those are the benefits of a micro leader and, and why I fish it. Uh, there again, all it is is just a thinner version of a Euro, Euro leader. Okay, um, so that's pretty much all we have time for since Instagram actually limits these live sessions to an hour. Um, but uh, if you want more, remember, um, uh, I run a site called tacticalflyfisher.com, and we sort of specialize in competitive techniques, both uh, Euro nymphing, but also other sort of technical uh, competitive approaches that, that we use in the World Championships, both for rivers and for lakes. So if you have uh, any gear needs there, we've got plenty to help you out, including a whole bunch of uh, uncle flies that are tailored towards Euro nymphing with lots of tungsten beaded nymphs and things like that, including my own patterns that I have with Unqua. Um, and this video will be on YouTube. And if you want more Euro nymphing materials, I have our YouTube channel, my blog at Tactical Fly Fisher uh, as well. And then we have uh, the, our three instructional films, Modern Nymphing, uh, European Inspired Techniques, Modern Nymphing Elevated, and also Adaptive Fly Fishing. Um, that are three full length instructional films that I did with Lance Egan uh, that Gilbert really shot for us. And then I also have my book, uh, Tactical Fly Fishing um, Lessons from Competition for All Anglers, which is really sort of giving uh, my approach that I take during competitions and making it uh, available to anybody who wants to learn those. Um, and thanks for all your questions. Obviously, we couldn't get to them all because we were limited, but uh, Umqua, the Umqua guys kept them. And, uh, we might be able to use them in a future discussion down the road. So thanks everybody for, for tuning in tonight. I really hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for the interaction and, and for your questions and, and uh, keep on fishing. And, and if uh, you have any more questions or any, any needs for your gear and your tying, come on over to tacticalflyfisher.com and 